Hello, everyone. Hello, Tom. Hello, Hello Ben. Good to see you there. Hi. Good to see you too. Yes, great. Welcome to the Mycelium Network, Ben. Hi. Thank so, you. Yes, great to have you. Awesome. Here for you, here come the people. Hello, girls. Hello, Hannah. Hello, so. Hello. Hey, hey. Ah. How are we all doing? Hi, Julia. Hi, Tony. Awesome. I'm not actually Emily Ashworth. I don't know why it's got that number. Oh, that's Nikki, huh? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> why it's got Emily, I don't know. Uh, we were watching something together. That's probably why. Uh huh. Probably changed the name, rename. There we go. <laughs> Hello, all. Hello, Nicola. It's appropriate backdrop for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Los Cedros. Ah, oh, hi, Nicola. Hey, Nikki. I'm, I'm watching you on the big screen because uh, that's why I'm sideways from my laptop. Oh. <laughs> it's all a bit weird. You were very good on Accidental Gods. I like that. Oh, my God. Oh. That's so good, Nicola. I'm halfway through. It's it's brilliant. Well done. Yeah. I know I've had a couple of people. Say, it, it, there's a part of me kind of thinking of listening to it by myself, but I mean, I've never. <laughs> but it seems a bit random to listen to myself do an interview. But it's like I can't remember what we even spoke about. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. Well, she had to keep. She had to keep um, doing new bit, other bits. Um, yeah, extra bits which I've never heard her do before because you talk so much. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. You know me too well. <laughs> no, it was great. It was really good. Really good. And then Puran was the week after you. He was also very good. And and uh, she was recording Yuli today. Yay! <laughs> so Yuli's here as well. Hey, Yuli. Hello. <laughs> hi, Yuli. Hi. <laughs> oh, hi. Where's Ben? Hi, Nikki. I bet. Yay. Yeah, great. Well, I think we should probably start, guys. Uh, Because Nicola's right here in the centre of the screen. I just wanted to nod to Nicola, who I was trying to think of what I could call this podcast, because I wanted to, um, what I could call this new uh, series, because I really wanted to do something that sort of celebrated how many amazing female compost creators and regenerative practitioners we've got in the network. And I couldn't think of anything that was like vaguely good, but the your website that lot has long inspired me. I don't know if everyone's uh, any everyone's ever seen, but your original web website, which has got tons of great information on it, this one, Eyes of Gaia, um, <laughs> gave me the idea. I just call it call it Stories of Gaia because you know it's just so appropriate. Like you know, Gaia Gaia is the voice of Mother Nature and. This, this is what we need like more than ever is uh is this is this voice in this age of kind of crazy extractive patriarchal capitalism right and um yeah so i sort of took inspiration from this website which i'd read years ago and it had given me inspiration to like start you know doing more stuff with drinks because of how bad coca-cola was and you know these you sort of planted these activist seeds in for years um even i know you just keep this this is your old website now and it's kind of really outdated but it's still uh so i can see why you keep it going because there's so much good information and i thought yeah it's too it's too much to move that's the trouble <laughs> yeah um yeah it does feel very old school that website but every so often i think of taking it down and then i hear a story like that you know like oh the coca-cola bit inspired me to make drinks and I had this other woman once that had a retreat center and I was thinking I needed to cull it I was like this is ridiculous you know over the I don't know how long it's been up 20 years or something and you know every so often I get passionate about a new thing and I make a new tab and then I thought right I need to cull it and one of them was all about toilets and I thought okay now you know I've got to get rid of you know you guys would not be agreeing with this but you know I, like, I just need to get rid of the compost toilet tab you know maybe not everybody's into compost toilets uh, maybe I just need to cut it and, uh, and then this woman with the retreat center, she said, well, oh, eyes of guy. Oh, that really helped me. I was wanting to build a compost toilet for the retreat center. 
And I came across these and it showed me all these different options. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I'll keep the compost toilet tab. <laughs> so yeah, it's just been this yeah. random site which has its own kind of life, even though it's like, you know, you can't, I don't think you can't even open it on a phone, you know, it's so old school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Predates the internet almost. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um so yeah, I thought this would be a really great way of stimulating conversations because I think a big part of what we're all doing is 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 working towards the movement of localism. Um and and this is kind of, you know, I think I think yeah, I actually heard it in your podcast again, Nicola. Like it's it's the simplest solution to the the meta crisis that we all face. It's like uh and we're trying to 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 do that in our own ways by regenerating soil and making compost and um you know the the only way i think localism can work is through networks and through networks are built on relationships and i thought what well, we we need a culture of of sharing our knowledge sharing inspiration connecting with others um and and sharing our stories as well um so i just thought this would be something we could do um uh, and I want to keep these events going as a monthly exchange of things and encourage people to uh, to make presentations. Uh, I feel really grateful for being encouraged in my journey of like getting into all the regenerative world that um, some some place along the way, people said, would you give a presentation? I was like, that sounds like, you know, terrifying, which is exactly what uh, I think Amy and Jess said. Um, uh, but it's... It, it, it's it's a really useful experience um to to just force yourself to do it and learn better ways of of of, of communicating our stuff and these days you can basically say everything can't you with a little with, with 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 images and videos and stories so i hope that uh it'll be valuable to those presenting who maybe haven't before um and that the presentations can can grow and develop and help you with your projects as well um and we are such a kind of you know sympathetic and we shared value we you know we 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 are, are going to be a very encouraging um supportive audience which is what we we need so um i'm going to start with um amy and jess if that's all right um and and then and then we'll go to um you guys are in in kent so we'll start in the east and then we'll go to all the way to um hay and why in wales all the way to the west and then we'll come to nicola who's are you in you're in you're at your home in pulborough at the moment nicola so there you go there's a bit of the bioregional aspect um so yeah Je jess and amy um i would would love to hear from you uh I, you haven't got a name for your talk but it's all about your your project the heart and soil community and um yeah Please, uh, I'll make you host now. And thank you. Okay. Um, You're now the host. Oh, I'm the host now. Okay, right. I'm going to try and share this screen thing, which I've never done before. So, and would everybody mind if I turn my video off? I've got really crappy internet, and it's meant to help. <laughs> That's fine. Yes, whatever needs to be done. Amy. It's actually a good idea when people are presenting um, for everyone to turn the videos off. Uh, just keeping because there's so much bandwidth so much more energy is taken when we have our videos on so i do recommend people like keep tom you've got to have someone keep it on because if everyone turns it off all of a sudden you're just talking to these black screens but it is something that's worth doing it's like when someone's presenting we don't need to see each other anyway it's nice to see everyone's faces to start with but then when someone's presenting i often say that oh please everyone take your turn your cameras off and then when we finish all come back on and turn the cameras back on so uh yeah better saving energy people yeah <laughs> Reduce. Thank you, Nicola, for that. Um, um, can can we see these screen things? What they're called slides. <laughs> yeah. So if you click share you screen. Oh, I have to see that. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's in the middle. In the middle of the bar at the bottom should be share screen on your screen now. Screen. There we go. Beautiful. Yes, we've got it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, I want to move that, don't I? Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. So, um, we're Jess and Amy from Heart and Soil Community, 
Um, we are based in North Kent in Faversham, very small town called Faversham. Um, and Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Amy. So I um, work in a community garden um, on a project called Growing Our Future. Um, and Jess uh, volunteered there with me and we dreamt up this project because um, we love making compost together. We're just real <laughs> composting enthusiasts. And we wanted to make more and we wanted to retain more waste as a local resource. Um, so we started to dream up ideas of how we could facilitate um, making more compost and involving more people in it. Um, I'm Jess, I am a florist and a flower grower by trade. Um, and I yeah, started volunteering with Amy because I am um, post COVID when everything went awful for what I was doing wedding flowers, everything went awful for weddings. So I um, had a bit of a break, started volunteering with Amy and yeah, we just started making loads of compost and having loads of fun. Um, and we wanted a way to um, kind of get more people involved really. So we set up Heart and Soil Community. Um, we've put our focuses here. <laughs> um, do you want to start, Amy? Um, okay, yeah, I mean, we, we really tried to drill down into the benefits of composting personally for individuals um, in terms of like a way of taking daily climate action. Um, sort of, I, I really struggle with eco sort of anxiety um, like most people do, and it was just a really um, soothing thing to do. Um, and also the nature connection elements of it. Um, it felt like a simple and inclusive process um, it felt like a way um, of offering people a way of removing barriers to sort of no dig growing um, and a way to get more exercise um, and not and move and just be outside. Um, we talk about it as a magical and joyful process. I think um, one of the things we really, um, so we'll kind of we'll move on in a second to show you what we're doing with the project, but one of the things we really wanted to do was to get people excited about <laughs> about making compost and make it a as Amy said an inclusive process but just make it not scary I think there's a lot of reasons not to do things and um, so we just wanted to give people as many reasons to do it as possible okay um, so it was important for us because we we live in a small town everyone knows each other each um, other can't do anything without everyone knowing um, so it was important to us to make sure that we understood that there was a need in the town and in the local area before we started to develop something. So we wanted to kind of develop something as a response to an existing need and not just try to kind of take a load of people with us on something that might not happen. So um, community consultation was kind of a massive part of what we were trying to do from the beginning. And we spent a good few months just basically talking to everyone. Um, we identified a lot of the green businesses in Faversham and the surrounding area and started having conversations with them about what their needs were. And um, we talked to the town and borough council and councillors um, who I think Faversham is pretty progressive in what they're trying to do. I think they're a, um, what is it, Amy? What's, what town are we? Um, oh, God. Um, Some I'm specific gonna... green wildlife or something town. Um, so there's a lot of work already happening in Faversham. So that was quite a, a good one. We've got community gardens, we've got a lovely um, community orchard that's just started. Um, we started talking to local landowners, see if there was any chance we could get a piece of land anywhere, which we'll come back to in a bit. Uh, we've got a really amazing local market here where you can, as a community project, you can get like a stand there and chat to people. So we've done that a couple of times and spoken to everyone in Faversham. Uh, what else, Amy? We spoke to people who were trying to do what we were doing 20 years ago. Um, also, yeah, so people sort of who had a go um, many, many years ago also. Um, and just sort of tried to get a sense of whether it was something people were up for, um, which sort of leads on to the next slide. Um, because um, a private garden approached us because um, she was looking to host composting workshops and asked if we'd do that. So we developed... Um, a joyful composting workshop, which was sort of a, a three hour long um, workshop, a sort of deep dive into the why, why compost, um, some of the basic um, kind of the composting basics 
um, and sort of including games of sort of sorting green and brown ingredients. Um, and we really like to make it, we tried very hard to make it feel as simple and um, accessible for people as possible. Um, and we also um, built a heap um, and it just went down really, really well. Um, so we thought, right, we can do this. So we applied to Kent Community Foundation and got some funding to roll it out um, in with a different name called Head Heart Hands Compost um, to the community gardens. And we were really surprised that they were they were really up for it and needing it and wanting it and wanting help and um they were just really, really well attended. So we've done three of those. We've got another couple to do. Um, so that's just that's just been really positive. And people have um, sort of asked us to deliver workshops who we didn't even, even really know about. So it's, yeah, it's landed really well. We also developed a workshop for more for families and children called We've Got Worms. Um, and we started again, we started that as a pilot. We actually got some funding from um our local green councillors members grants each councillor gets 10 grand a year to decide kind of disseminate how they wish so we asked them for some money and they gave us some um and um so we did these two workshops they were an hour and a half long each for five families and um, we started off discussing why worms are so great and what composting worms do for us uh, we used all recycled materials a lot of them donated by local businesses to build a wormery for each family. And um, then we gathered to discuss how to look after them. We made up a little game called Worm Dinner, Not a Winner to illustrate this. Um, we had Play-Doh and colouring in and stuff. It was really fun and really well received. Kids loved it and they took their, kid, uh, took their worms home. And so far from what we've heard, they are still going strong. And this was about six months ago first one of these was so really pleased with that we've now um got some funding to roll this out into schools so we're going to go into three schools in Faversham and help them build wormeries for the classroom mm -hmm. then so going forward yeah we'd, be, we'd, we'd really like to um I don't know just kind of um go up a gear in terms of the compost we're making and sort of linking groups and businesses um by trying to get a ride and get funding for a ride in, um, and do more community composting. But so far, we've really struggled to find a location, a site for that, um, which has been hard. Um, but we want, uh, there's sort of more appetite for the, the sort of training. So we'd like to do more workshops. Um, and we're also going to d design an experience for an event called um, the Lovely World Project. Um, which we're going to try and make really interactive and fun um, for kids. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. And it will give us something that's a bit more um, interactive to roll out. We did um, quite a few events last year and it's really hard to um, engage people in this when they're not able to get stuck in. Um, so, yeah, we're just trying to think how best to bring that. I'm excited about that. And then uh, Tom, asked, Tom asked us to share our struggles and successes. So successes, um, we've had some really lovely feedback and um, we connected to that. There's, there is a real genuine need for composting support from both the community gardens um, who, I think the community gardens in our experience have found that the volunteers who come in don't necessarily know or they're not confident in what they're doing around the compost heap so um you know they've had a genuine need for some support there that we've been able to meet and um yeah we've been approached by people who weren't even on our radar to do to do composting workshops which has been really fun and then struggles um yeah getting cic status was really hard work for jess <laughs> um, ongoing access to land so to, to a space um paying ourselves um we've just had sort of discrete project funding um so we've put in lots and lots of hours without being paid um so but i guess that's part of the course um and also just having bubbies and um struggling just juggling that constantly um we haven't had the time we've needed um 
and we had a few questions for the group um, uh, around finding space and access to land to compost in. And we're also interested in um, like compost clubs um, where um, sort of community composting clubs, if anybody has any experience to share on that, that'd be good. Thank you. Totally. totally. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. That was brilliant. That was so nice to see. I loved it. The um, it's just beautiful to see how you're integrating, like, yeah, the just fun and playfulness and art into like composting, bringing it in, making it um, kind of accessible for people of all ages. Uh, it was really, really cool. And yeah, I know that you're in the right group. We can help with the how to do the compost club setup and ties really nicely with um where we're going to head next i think what would be great is if we um if we sort of save up all our questions and then we'll have a uh a, a really good q a at the end so yeah over to hannah and sophie who um similar to jess uh, have got worms uh, jess and amy have got have got worms <laughs> it's integral to their project hey i got worms is the name of their their compost club and it's just been so much fun watching these guys uh get people together um, to start a compost club since we met online a couple of years ago now and um, yeah I wanted to I wanted to get them to do a story and it sounds like they've got a story about a worm to tell us <laughs> um shall I okay awesome mm -hmm. you're gonna be the host now cool well, hey just a bit small okay can you guys see that have you got it yes Okay, great. Um, so thanks so much, Amy and Jess. That was brilliant um, to see what you're doing. Really awesome. And I love that you've got worms too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really cool. Um, and you're kind of doing the other side of what we've not really quite managed to do yet. So that was really uh, lovely to see that. Um, yeah, we're Hey Regenerative Soils Kick. And Hey We Got Worms is the project name of our compost club. Um, and we'd hope to have more project names in the future, I guess, projects in the future. Um, I'm Hannah Paget. Um, I have a background in collaborative design or co-creation and community engagement. I've done that um, in public artworks, uh, street design and uh, social marketing kind of areas with various Sustrans and um, various different organisations. And then I went on to um, do a practical sustainability year long course with Shift um, Bristol. Um, and now I teach the uh, co-design um, module um, there. And that's where I kind of got my permaculture basis from um, an understanding of the soils first kind of like, like mind blown moment really, um, like, wow, there's this much going on beneath our feet. Mm -hmm. Um, I now work for the Ecological Land Cooperative, um, helping new entrant farmers to um, access land to live and work on the land. Um, and I'm, I also make cheese two days a week for Neil Jard Creamery, and I'm a ceramicist. Wow. So much going on. <laughs> um, so I'm Sophie Ferrer. I'm an ecological artist who started this journey of soil loving work over about seven years ago now which started in Australia, I was studying permaculture, centropic and regenerative farming, and then going into citizens of the soil sciences, um, growing, and now I'm doing a contemporary design craft degree focusing on art and ecology. So, um, yeah, we, we came together with our love of ceramics and permaculture, and um, we both kind of express our interest in soil and growing through our work and um, this is my um, design business worldwide design um, I'm interested in um, traditional um, technologies old technologies so um, top left is a compost jar which uses a water lock um, to keep the smells in and the flies out and at the bottom left is a fermentation jar which can create an anaerobic um, environment um, with the water lock as well and then top right is um, an Oya, um, which is a 4,000 year old technology for irrigation underneath the soil, feeding the roots or watering the roots using um, soil mo moisture um, tension. So um, it really saves masses on water, like 90% on um, against the evaporation on the surface. And then below that is um, 
some microgreens growing on the surface of the oya. So it's a different design. And uh, my creative practice started with ceramics, which were highly illustrative wares symbolizing folklore and the law of the land. Two more sculptural pieces representing the biodiversity of soils and even a ceramic wormery reliquary that's been living in Hereford Cathedral for a couple of weeks. Two guardians of the soil, which was a ritualistic performance piece, are four soil guardians mourning the loss of the topsoil we lose each year. So all of these are in an attempt to close the communication gap between the research and the general audience. And also I have spoken to Perry, um, but if anyone else wouldn't mind me interviewing them regarding their practice around soil, just please message me on WhatsApp. I would love to interview you all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Hannah and I actually met in 2020. I was a head grower and desperately needed some volunteers. So Hannah came to help and I was fascinated by her creative practice and also for her love for permaculture and the soil. And I wanted to be doing more things that involved practical wares that had some kind of relationship to composting and permaculture and whatnot. And Hannah asked if I wanted to collaborate. So we made this compost vessel and this uh, plate and it was a really lovely learning experience. Um, but a couple of months later, she organised myself and some friends to come and meet up because she wanted to pitch to us a compost club idea that she'd seen somewhere else. <laughs> so, um, yeah, at the beginning of 2021, I uh, attended a presentation by Danny Baller at um, Co Resist, and Tom was presenting this amazing compost club um, in Brighton, like loads of different sites already in a year. It was like stunning progress. Mm -hmm. um, and it just really inspired me. I was just like, I think I'd been kind of waiting for a project to come along that was really accessible, that brought me kind of closer to the land and the earth, um, closer to the natural world um, in a kind of activism sense, but in a positive way. Um, and something also that would fit around my work that I could kind of commit to, but just progress kind of uh, uh, along the way and um, make an impact. But you know, do my bit, you know. Um, so yeah, I pitched it to friends, uh, five friends, um, well, five of us kind of got on board and um, set to work. And in July, we had a launch event in the Globe in Hay, where we screened the Guardians of the Soil, Sophie's Guardian of the Soil film. And we pitched the compost club idea to everyone. And um, there was a really good turnout. And everyone was really um excited about the idea there was loads of ideas um coming forward about particularly about cardboard um because there's lots of that in our town and um yeah we just took that as a go ahead to go and find a site and um get things moving so in august we um spoke to some um friends um who have this uh, wildlife camping site right next to the y and um, sophie had been doing some work for them and um they were really interested in the idea and just gave us a, a bit of um, land on their kind of site um, to put the tumbler. And so we got busy making some money to buy a tumbler. Um, and that was the benefit gig in November. We had to delay it a few times for COVID, but um, we had a great turnout. We had loads of artists donate lots of work for a raffle and all the musicians um, performed for free. And we made, like almost exactly enough to mm -hmm. buy uh, a draw form tumbler in December. So then um, January 22, we put it all together. It was kind of bare and just the tumbler um, and a few maturation bays kind of came later. And we started sourcing also the uh, carbon materials and from friends and um, also from the sawmills and stuff nearby. Um, I'd been also struggling through the uh, kick process and also wondering whether we should be a community benefit society and like weighing it all up doing it's just such a lot of reading of really complicated language and horribleness but um, in February we um, were registered um, and confirmed as a, a kick which was very exciting mm -hmm. um, the bank uh, account was just continuous nightmare um, and we'd been doing it for absolutely ages trying to get that sorted and we couldn't do anything or start like memberships until we had that um, but it was just taking forever and people were kind of like when when can we start you know we, they wanted to to get on board so we said okay we'll do a, a month or one collection a one three week collection for free um, and get you on board and get into the system and then when the bank comes open we'll um, we'll start charging you so we had like 
about eight um, members quite uh, like straight away. And that um, kicked off and we've been doing that ever since every three weeks collecting from, um, I think we've got 10 members now for our one Tumblr. Um, we also started a relationship with the co-op um, and became a co-op cause. And so they have this um, several different causes in the community and they're guaranteed roughly about five grand, a bit more maybe. So we knew that we could kind of work towards getting that funding and pay for like three tumblers and, and a cardboard shredder potentially. So and like work out where the sites might be and where the members might be. And it kind of felt like quite a big kind of sudden expansion because we were expecting it that October. <laughs> we were a bit kind of worried about mm -hmm. how quickly that was going to happen. And then when October came around, we realized it wasn't that October, it's this coming October in 23. So sigh of relief a bit. Um, and yeah, that was fine. But um, we continued to kind of link up with various different organizations and events and things that were going on, um, like Lift the River, um, <clears throat> which um, is all about uh, the River Y and the phosphates that are going into the river. It felt like a really kind of common cause for us because obviously if we can regenerate the soils and um, the soils hold on to a lot more water there's less runoff holding onto the topsoil much better and it just felt like a, a good relationship so we continue to kind of work with them in the background um, we reached out to some uh, regen regenerative farmers locally and um, to try and just get their take on if they how we could work with them to sort of expand into a farm scale um, and there's us standing in a field with Humphrey um, and yeah he's he's connected with a lot of traditional farmers and he said that there's a lot of like movement towards regenerative farming and interest in it so you know when we're at a stage that we can do it we want to kind of start talking to those farmers and um, thinking about how we can kind of upscale into that like, farm scale level. Um, and then in October, Tom came to visit and to give us a seal of approval on our setup, mm -hmm. which was really nice and gave us a bit of advice. Um, and then in December, we um, got some volunteers. So we've got like three regular volunteers now that come and help us with the collections every three weeks, um, which is good. And there's actually, I mean, there's a picture of Sophie Owen, well, back, Owen's back and That's Daisy nice. in the middle. Um, no, in the middle oh. with, the sh with the shirts on and all the printed shirts. Um, yeah, so our team currently is Owen, Daisy, um, me and Soph, and we meet every week, um, pretty much, um, just, and things are moving pretty quickly, actually. It's all quite full on. It is. <laughs> um, so at the start of this year, we were involved in the cooperative organisation meetup, which involved mingling with the other organizations in Hay and sharing volunteers and knowledge expa uh, knowledge on expanding, which was really, really helpful. Um, we are currently building a relationship up with Pedicargo, uh, which, which are a bicycle powered recycling service in Hereford to see if their infrastructure can support us as we try to expand and to become carbon neutral. Um, and we actually sent Perry our first sample this morning from two of our maturation bays, um, hopefully ready to sell, um, which will be taken to the markets in Hay and Y, which are uh, really busy. Everyone from Hay comes out on these markets um, to buy their groceries and luxuries. So that'd be super beneficial to us. Um, we've got a benefit gig in April, um, which was lovely because the establishment reached out to us wanting to support us in any way, shape and form. So again, this will help us raise some money We've been offered a table at the Royal Welsh Agricultural Show to talk about what we've been up to and composting in a community setting. Um, and we've also been approached by How the Light Gets In Festival, which is an annual festival that runs alongside the famous Literacy Book Festival regarding their food waste. Um, and we have actually confirmed to them that we'll be doing it on our site using the Windrow method. Um, and we've been suggested to take on the food waste from Russell Brand's community festival, but we haven't quite got that rolling yet. But by December, hopefully with the money raised from the co-op funding and the benefit gig, we'll have enough money to buy a bicycle powered cardboard treader, which will bring us into the new year with the ability to take on a carbon subscription. Um, Hay and White is the town of books and we have an unbearable amount of carbon uh, cardboard in the streets once a week, thus bringing in a new income stream. So we're also hoping in the future to 
get a ride in. Uh, we have a lot of cafes who know about us and want us to take their food waste, but due to the large quantities, we don't really feel like it could work in the Duraform tumbler setup. Um, but we are also hoping to expand more tumblers throughout the Hay on Wye village. And we've got about five sites that are happy to take us on. Um, and hopefully in the future, develop some additional products such as biochar and compost tea and all very exciting. <laughs> um, we are also um, trying to build a relationship with Black Mountains College. They're just around the corner from us and they're about to start um, the end of this year, um, September, I guess. Um, their uh, like degree in regenerative agriculture and systems change which is pretty groundbreaking by all, all accounts. Um, and we just think that it'd be really great to work with them as lots of crossover. Um, and uh, a member of ours who's also really involved with XR um, and has done quite a, um, good projects with the council and the community in Hay, um, wants to establish three strands of independence in Hay, one of them being food independence. And he's approached us to kind of um eventually like create the fertility for um like food production for hay so that we can like really close the nutrient uh, cycle which was our our aim at the beginning was always about like the nutrients that are in the town they shouldn't be being transported to bridge end um and burning carbon as it goes and you know it's just uh it doesn't make sense. We want to keep that fertility, everything in, in hay mm. um, and grow really nutrient dense food. So that's a kind of long term goal um, and not much is kind of moving with that. But I think he Mike wants to uh, educate the young people in hay at Black Mountains College in Citizens Assembly so they can teach the adults about hay food independence. So that would be kind of radical and really amazing to be mm. involved in. Um, so yeah, our successes um, have definitely been integrating into the community. We've, like um, Amy and Jess, been approached by all sorts of people interested in connecting with us, um, which has been really nice and really um, just exciting to see how like how it can spread and um, get involved with everyone. Um, the businesses and households who we've got on board are really, really in, in supportive and um helpful to us we've got a great network um so we can access loads of waste materials um around the local area and um yeah we've survived over a year of doing this alongside our full-time jobs and full-time university um which is like probably the hardest thing um just making time and supporting each other when um you know it's overwhelming doing something else um we can cover each other's backs and and keep things rolling um, and I think we've probably produced a ton bag of soil, which I think is probably about half a ton of soil. I don't know, we haven't got scales. So, um, <laughs> but we're collecting data, which is good. And there's loads of opportunities for expansion um, coming our way, which is great. So we just got to choose, like, we just couldn't plan it all out and, um, you know, do it all sensibly, I guess. Yeah. I mean, the challenges have been. Um... Yeah, becoming uh, business partners with your pals has been so challenging. Like feeling through those, those, those new dynamics has been interesting. And um, starting from scratch as well. Like for me personally, I've never been involved in a kick before, so that's been incredibly challenging. Understanding everything that's involved with that, uh, as well as the business knowledge, um, totally new for me. Um, a lot of us are leaning on Hannah a lot <laughs> for the business knowledge um yeah capacity we so I'm in university but Hannah Owen and Daisy they all have like three other jobs so um we we are always really short for time so it's mad that we've got anything done it's incredible um and we also have so many opportunities coming up for expansion but it's so hard to know what to say yes to um with all the little time that we have so it's really really difficult knowing what we should be taking risks on as well. Um, no time to increase the knowledge. I mean, the mycelium network is, it's absolutely amazing that we have that at our, that our fingertips, but it, it feels like we can't consume it fast enough. <laughs> and um, also understanding all the regulations and the licensing and the planning permissions and 
that's all it's all <laughs> it's insane <laughs> i think on our list has been to like maybe do a lane ingram's course if we can get funding perhaps to send us like one or all of us on on a short course or something so that we can kind of really get up there with the soil uh life knowledge um mm. would be really great um yeah so that is us thank you very much and our contact details please get in touch if there's any anything you want to connect on um yeah um yeah any questions mm -hmm. That was absolutely amazing, guys. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't have, uh, you couldn't have given a better answer to Amy and Jess's question of like, we really want to know how to set up a compost club. Um, like, yeah. Stop sharing. Okay. Just brilliant. Um, yeah, I totally hear you. All of, all of, all of it, all of the problems. Oh, hi, Daisy as well. Hi. Well done. Just like, just, yeah, I, you get by with a little help from your friends right in these things like okay. basically you guys have done so well in building a community um that's made it kind of possible because it is a nightmare doing all of the different jobs that you need to run a viable business i just want to say like nikki would you video up for us to, uh, if you're there um because nikki inspired basically informed before I even knew Nikki, it was his documents um, for, from an organization he used to run composting in the community network. Uh, sorry, no, that's the current one, Community Composting Network, which like gave us the, um, gave gave me the idea that it could be done. Uh, Nikki's totally like, you know, the, fo the founder of the idea of compost clubs really in this scene. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Nikki's Nikki's already answers is there to answer tons of questions, um, and uh, and has helped a, a lot a lot of us. Especially, there's a, there was one a brilliant earlier session we did, which I wish I'd published separately because Nikki's talk on like forcing legalities is really valuable. Um, we could, um, but I was there, I think. were you there for that? Yeah, I mean, it's just. I mean, just in this age, just doing it is the way to do it. And that's what you guys have done. And we we all have to do because truth is like the compost police don't exist yet. And and when they if they do, then we're gonna be we're gonna be ready for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, I think that's right, Tom. Just get on and do it. And uh, you know, the, the idea of the compost clubs was so that you could actually because there's a lot of clubs out there that get around all sorts of rules and regulations. And so we thought, well, hey, if you know, if you can have that, the Tories having a members club that can get away with all sorts of things, you know, that kind of thing, right. then we can do it with compost. Um, because once you're in a club, it, it it sort of negates a lot of the legislation. And it was a grey area when we mooted it first, but we spent a lot of time talking to politicians and things about this stuff. And and it, in it, in the end, they just go away. But I think. Uh, it's so inspiring to hear both those presentations. I just want to say that because it was, it's brilliant to hear, you know, because we we were starting this years ago and there was no one else out there. And it's just so heartening to see so many people doing this stuff all over the place. That's the first thing I wanted to say. And I think, um, you know, you have just got to not be not be worried by the legislation, just keep doing it. But it's a good idea to form a relationship with the Environment Agency locally so that they know what you're doing and they trust you so it's good to develop those um relationships with people and get them on your on side so they you don't come across as these wacky people who are trying to pollute things you're actually part of the solution not part of the problem and i think that's really that's a really wise thing to do is just to befriend people in the local authority which it seems like you're doing anyway which is great fantastic um, but also, but particularly the environment agency. And of course, if you're dealing with food waste, you're also dealing with DEFRA and the state veterinary service. So you've got to be mindful of that bit of the legislation. But it doesn't mean you don't do it. It just means that you do it properly and you've got you've got a kind of the documentation. I mean, at least you've written sort of risk assessments and, you know, or you've adopted some, you know, we've already done it, actually. So we can just send um, share around that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, we've got permits from the um, National Resources Wales, Natural Resources Wales, which right. is the Environment Agency in Wales. Um, right. But yeah, that's as far as we've got, really. We haven't got risk assessments or 
um, and we haven't got in touch you know with them in any real sense just to apply for that permit so yeah. it's quite yeah. nice to actually find a friendly face within within there I mean I, I I was lucky in Devon I found someone and she and she's been absolutely you know fantastic mm. <laughs> so that when uh, you know we were trying to start we were trying to start a project in Exeter a, an urban project and uh, she said it, it seemed all very difficult when we were going run run circles he said well i tell you what we could take it on as the environment Here are some results from us. and just do it as a sort of um under our as a as a one of our projects if you like mm -hmm. you know and we we can run it um or we can take responsibility for it but basically we can then hand it over yeah that's, that's how that project never got off the ground but you know the, it is a mechanism that's there mm. Uh, so guys i want to um get on to nicola's talk um fairly soon um i just wanted to share though that uh i am totally up for uh, i really want to help everyone that wants to, to do a compost club and if you need if you need my uh if you would like to talk um you could either there's two ways of doing it either just get, get in touch with me or, or nikki or anyone through the whatsapp group um and we'll be happy to help or um you could you could use the forum just to say the compost the, the spaces on the left here are how they work now so there's a compost club space and just post any question you have and it will be a place we can you know that information can be can be stored and you can search what other people have looked like for like pricing and uh all of that just use it use its search function um and, and post questions up you can post a file um, or a or a picture, or or you can do a poll just to sort of get uh, you know the opinions of the group. Um, and likewise, just... yeah, go on, Hannah. I say to um, yeah, Amy and Jess that if they if they want to kind of pick our brains about the detail of what we've been through and what our challenges were, particularly around sites, then I'd be really happy to have a call or a text, like a, a WhatsApp chat. Thank you, oh, thank you so great. much. Yeah. Yeah, it's easier if you have that like back and forth, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes. Thank you. Great. So good. Thanks, guys. Okay, lovely stuff. Well, we're going to um, have plenty of time for a, a, a good Q&A afterwards on all these things. Um, so much. It's just such a big world, isn't it? But um, yeah, I wanted to pass the mic to Nicola now um, just to talk to us. Every time I've seen Nicola recently, like they, she's been... Um, uh, orientated in the uk for quite some time like uh, i've known nicola for a, quite a lo large number of years and they, they she's always been uh in other continents doing her doing her activism for her part of the year but she's been really getting stuck into the um systems here in the uk i feel in the last few years and every time i've spoken to her she's told me something really inspiring about changing minds in these institutions and all of you know this the structures of this current world um nicola is brilliant at calling people yeah getting just just taking things up, up further than you would normally think to do she's very quick and super inspiring so nicola um i i've uh, yeah i asked you to make a 10 minute presentation which will be just be a drop in the ocean of what you can share but uh it'll be all <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it was so great seeing the other presentations I mean it's so nice to kind of really ground it into you know this kind of like local reality so I'm going to kind of expand it quickly globally to just give you an overview of what I've been doing and then bring it back to kind of local as well so I'm just going to okay let's Yeah, that. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm still working on it. Let's just get it to full screen. Okay, well, you can see my job title is I'm a solutionist. So, you know, my interest is really not in talking about the problems. It's talking about, you know, what we can do. So I'm just going to kind of fly through a bit of an overview of my work. So as Tom said, I spent 20 years working in the Amazon, in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And I went down originally um, all the way down the Amazon River to do a film about the oil industry. 
So that was kind of my kind of awakening, seeing this kind of hidden story of what was going on. And it's like, it's massive, you know, a thousand toxic pits left behind by um, Texaco. So it's that kind of overwhelming of like, whoa, you know, what can we actually do about it? So I learned about microremediation. And I brought together a team of mycologists and biologists, and we founded the Amazon Micro Renewal Project. So we started off with Pleurotus osteratus, working on showing how we could use mushrooms to break down oil spills. So that was, you know, back in 2006. And I made the film about that solution to the pollution, about microremediation in the Amazon. So that was kind of one of the, the aspects of what can we do to deal with this like massive amounts of contamination. And then obviously, you know, it's like everyone talks about deforestation and this is where, what can we do about deforestation? We need to teach about agroforestry. So this is what I've been doing. I've been teaching about alley cropping using this particular tree, Inga edulis, which is brilliant nitrogen fixer, native, fast growing, does all the things that we want to do to regenerate soil again. So this was just like an old cattle pasture, hard and compacted, nobody could grow anything on it. So they just go and cut down more forest. And that's the cycle that we have in the tropics of slash and burn, always looking for you know more fertile soil. So it's just a chop it and drop it system. You know, we pollard it. And then within six weeks, you can grow straight into that mulch between the alleys. So this is, oh, it's running away with me. And then our project in, in Africa, they use this wood for cooking wood. But in the Amazon, gas is so cheap, they don't use it for that. So we're turning it into biochar. So we haven't got any kilns or retorts or anything like that. It's the old fashioned way of just making small pits and making, you know, biochar there on site with each of the farmers. And so bringing biochar back to the Amazon and using all this pollarded wood. So that's how the system that we have been creating biochar there on site. And then the local people themselves have been doing their own biochar experiments. And, and this guy is like just super amazed how the chupadoras, the, the insects that, you know, kind of suck, uh, nibble away at the plants, just don't seem to be crossing the biochar. So that's quite a big call in the Amazon, you know. So we're just starting um, looking and doing more research on, on the use of biochar out there too. But you can see the difference there's hardcore grass and then once we've shaded it all out through the trees and created this new system they can then grow anything they like between it but we've really got excited by the whole cacao industry which are in serious problems due to fungal pod rot at the moment they're throwing so many fungicides and agrochemicals on cacao um, basically, they're just losing cacao. It's being taken over. It doesn't like to be a monoculture. And we have accidentally discovered through this system of agroforestry that if you grow cacao in between the alleys, they don't get pod rot. So all of a sudden, Reading University are all over it. I've got six PhD students that want to go down there. I've just had a master's student studying our soil biodiversity. So that's kind of a way of like, OK, if we can actually help save the forests so they don't have to keep cutting down more, looking for fertile soil to grow their crops, then, you know, that's kind of a real way of being able to build soil for them. And that's ultimately why I'm doing it is how do we stop the encroaching agriculture? whether that's for cattle or soya or all the palm oil or what we usually think of. And then more recently, massive deforestation for taro. And when I questioned why, what are they cutting all the forest for taro now? And they told me, oh, it's all being imported, exported to Europe and America. I was like, why is Europe and America? I don't know anyone that eats taro. Why are we importing vast amounts? And basically it's, I was sent a research paper and it is the vegan plant-based diet 
that is now demanding new carbohydrates to make you know this kind of processed food so you know it just brings it back again to that what are we doing and uh so yeah all of my kind of work has been really kind of based around forests primarily but coming back to the UK and I also founded the Southeast Climate Alliance and four years ago, we had 12 organizations, and that was any kind of like environmental, social, or faith based organization working on the climate and ecological collapse. We've now got over 130 organizations in Sussex, Surrey, Kent, and Hampshire. So, this bioregion creating an alliance where we've just been, you know, like only a few months ago, contacted by Westminster to go and represent local community groups. So, like talking about the importance of coming together in clubs, in alliances, in networks bioregionally is, is really powerful, you know. I mean, I love that old say, you know, African proverb one stick is easily broken, but a bundle together isn't. So, you know, it's so important for us to work together. So from that, I also was like, you know, we need to be getting out to the people. And, you know, so we upcycled a milk float and created a road show where we could just get out there to the general public and whether that's, you know, giving out people some compost and getting them to like plant some seeds and take it home or, um, the milk float itself, you know, various volunteers are coming and doing all sorts of kind of education. And, you know, the float itself has got all this information all the way around it. So it's kind of an art piece in itself that um, it draws attention by people looking yeah. at it. So we're also asked to go out to schools and all sorts of events to take the roadshow and make it fun. It's like, how do we teach this stuff in a fun and engaging way? So we've kind of come up with all sorts of crazy ideas in the roadshow, but it's been really working and uh, we just need to kind of replicate it now, um, what we've done so that others can do something similar. But I was also recently well six months ago now I suppose asked Brin by Brinsbury College who is the largest agricultural college in the south who are very proud to say that they are officially outstanding however they're the largest agricultural college that teaches no kind of regenerative agriculture so I was asked if I would go in and teach the teachers this is head of education head of agriculture horticulture all of the heads of learning about regen ag so I went in there, I gave an hour's presentation on regenerative agriculture. And then when I asked them, do you have a lab? You know, what kind of soil testing are you doing? It's like, oh, yes, we do soil testing. Oh, what? Are you looking at mineral content or the actual life of the soil? Oh, well, no, we don't look at any of that kind of life. And uh, so, you know, it was really good to be kind of talking to them about everything from forest gardens to, you know, alley cropping to, to soil to composting and them agreeing that, yes, 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 they need to be teaching it. However, what they said was that the agricultural colleges are dictated by the government as to what they teach. And they told me that the most powerful way is to contact the NFU. Now, of course, nobody contacts the NFU apart from big farmers that are in the old system. And they were like, actually, the more people you can get to contact their local NFU representative and just say, I'm really interested in regenerative agriculture. You know, do you know where I can learn it? Or are there any farmers locally that are working with Regen Ag? I'd like to know who it is and visit them. The NFU have got to hear that there's a demand from local groups. So it was really powerful. I mean, this is, you know, the heads of learning saying we want to teach it, but it will come from the NFU. So it's like, how do we kind of work within that system and push from the outside to, you know, what we want them to be teaching at agricultural colleges? So I was just a quick whistle stop tour um, about the, you know, some of the work that that I've been doing. And I think some of my um, image slides were missing. Um, but another thing I wanted to talk about was um, the work with I've been doing with One Planet. And One Planet is a mapping system. 
I'm just going to like stop sharing. Oh, hang on. I'm thinking I'm going, I'm going on to another, <laughs> another presentation. I've also been teaching about biomimicry. Tom, you know, when we were at um, the seed swap and you said to this, this group from Brighton University, hey, she's the one that needs to give you a talk. Well, um, so yeah, I've been organizing the talk that I'm giving for them um, this week as well. Right. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're actually coming to pop oh, up. Oh, here we go. You guys would be interested. This is like kombucha fashion. Ooh. This is like the future of fashion, um, you know. And what we can also do with mushrooms is, um, you know, this whole kind of like movement away from this kind of old style into, you know, new materials. And um, yeah. Hungry packaging. So, yes. The packaging, the, yeah, you guys know it. All this is the kind of like using um, 3D printing material, which is made from mycelium. They're also doing it with seaweed. And, um, oh, there you go. There's the one planet. And uh, so, yeah, I'd really encourage any of you that to do MAPI. You can do it for free. Um, and if you want to take it a bit further, then you got to pay. But ideally, we need to get councils to be doing this mapping. So you can start with your own clubs and your own you know, bioregions to map using this framework. And then what happens is it's like creating this massive mind map. And we can start when everybody starts joining together, we can all kind of like move forward quicker, you know, joined up thinking and all that rather than this siloed, I'm just doing this. And uh, and so, yeah, it's been really fascinating working with One Planet and seeing how this mapping can be used, which um, we've just started getting some local groups to like, map their local towns and areas and then getting the councils to also start using this framework. So, you know, I can see huge amounts of potential um, in this. So yeah that's um i'm just gonna well that's what happened that last slide um swapped around but um yeah so there you go that's the last slide there for my um website nicolapeel.com but i'm just gonna stop sharing and uh, so there you go there was a whistle stop tour of um, some international and some national and some local work that, that I've been doing. And, and, you know, this kind of idea of eco-anxiety, which, you know, I'll be speaking about at the university as well. And, you know, my favorite saying, which is action is the antidote to despair. And, uh, you know, when we're busy and we're doing something, we don't have time um, to be in despair. And I think that's what we really need to encourage others to realize that every single one of us has a thread in the tapestry and we've all got to be doing it together. Mm. And whatever that is, and as we join up together, you know, the movement becomes even more powerful. So thank you, Tom, for inviting me and seeing all what you guys are doing, which is awesome. So yay, onwards. Yes, thank you, Nicola. That was bloody brilliant as usual thank you um yeah and 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 awesome awesome quotes in there i just made me think of another one yeah another african proverb which is um if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together and i think that's just what's it's just what's so powerful about all of this work is like there we are all just such drops in the ocean but we we we, we can do it everywhere and you know, many people making small changes in many places are going to change the world. And it's just about how to make it happen, how to accelerate it in a, in a way so that we can, you know, get to that, get to that scale of, and that, that movement so that it becomes something bigger than it's. Yeah. So, so yeah, thank you everyone. I'd, I'd love it if we could, um, burn a little bit more power and see everyone's faces for this conversation just for this q a can i just say um nicholas talk on accidental gods if you haven't heard of accidental gods do tune into nicholas talk and the one after is puran talking about the one planet much more than than nicholas just talked it was a two brilliant presentation and also um, my presentation for the Oxford Real Farming Conference has just been released. And oh. yesterday I spoke for Martin Crawford at the International Forest Gardening Symposium too. So, um, yeah. Wow. 
that sounds amazing yeah i love the way you, i mean the focus on trees is such a good one because trees are compost makers you know the trees are pumping carbon out of the sky they're, they're doing it faster than we can ever make compost so like protecting the forest is just like you know obviously the primary thing and and then making as much compost to repair the carbon that we can to to prepare the ground for trees again that's what i love about this compost making game it's like we can see now and we're all testing our compost we can get the fungi up the more fungi we can get back in the soil the better the trees are going to grow and take back the the land and and, and what you said nicola on the was it is it what's your thing called pay to breathe Pretty yes cool. yes this is my very controversial um you know blog that i wrote about paying to breathe it's like we pay for our food we pay for our water but what about the air that we breathe we take that for granted and where does it come from the oceans or the forests but the people that live there are in you know extreme financial poverty and so they are just having to cut the forests down, you know, and they always say to me, you know, it's not just that, you know, we need to cut the forest down for food. We want to send our kids to school. We need to get stuff. We have to cut the forest down. So what happens if we were actually to kind of link up with people and pay them for the air that we breathe to maintain and be the guardians of the forest? Somehow we've got to support the people that live in the forests. And they are the ultimate caretakers. So yeah, looking at different ways of being able to support, you know, ourselves. I mean, you know, we all know how hard it is to do this work and actually get paid for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people that want to do the right thing and protect the environment, it's like we've got to find ways of all supporting each other. Yeah, because everyone's talking about planting trees. I mean, it's the big thing, isn't it? Everyone's out planting trees all the place, but they don't talk about so much about saving the ancient trees or the older trees that are already standing and they're the ones that we really want much more important yeah. well this is one of the interesting things i've been working with the universities as well about pollarding trees so nobody seems to be working on the um carbon sequestration they all look at like let's plant a little tree and calculate how much carbon soil carbon and standing carbon but what about like an ancient tree in comparison to how long it takes for a little tree to grow. And then if you pollard it and you turn into biochar and then it grows again and you pollard it and you turn it into biochar and you pollard it, it's like, has anybody working on that? Oh no. <laughs> so, um, so at least I've got some interest now of people kind of getting this of saying, yeah, you know, we really need to do some more research on, you know, so yeah. Okay. Where should we go? There's so many great people here. And Mary, I just wanted to say, uh, Mary, hello, Mary. You're, I think Mary's doing some brilliant work with um, your page Soils and Fungi at the moment. Um, you guys probably noticed it, but um, it's really interesting what Mary's, where Mary's going with the microscopes. And uh, would you like to say a bit, just a bit about what you're doing, Mary? I, mean, I wouldn't say I'm anywhere yet at all. I would say that it's still a very beginning of journey, but yeah, I mean, I'm studying uh, my master's in soils, but I'm heading sort of in a soil mycology direction pretty fast. Um, I don't actually, I keep sort of changing where the direction's going, but I also help run the mycology society here. So I do help run a lot of events, which actually focuses not just also from the STEM background, but trying to bring everyone into understanding about mycology and connecting with mycology as well. So I do a lot of work there. Um, and hopefully, um, I also volunteer on a farm, a hundred acre farm here called Lauriston Farm. It's a really exciting project, which is run by Edinburgh's Agroecology Co-op. Very new, very exciting uh, stuff they've got going on there, but they don't have anyone that's sort of working on the soils at the moment. So I'm sort of trying to create a soils group um, which I'm hoping may start to fruit into engaging people in composting and soil workshops and stuff. So yeah, that's gonna be really exciting. Um, and yeah, I guess my interest in fungi um, is just all over the place at the moment. So yeah, 
<laughs> nice thank you thank you i just wanted to say on the back of that like i'm currently contacting labs um to to find out how we can get some testing done soil organic matter testing um because if we can do that then we we know that soil organic matter is is at least 50 percent carbon that is stable in the soil unless it's tilled you know it's and it's actually more like 58 percent apparently but uh then then we can start and we can start measuring and saying we are storing carbon in the soil and hopefully start putting some of the carbon credit money to some good use creating these livelihoods maybe giving back to you know people that can protect the forest nicola like you say so much if it comes down to like we've got to pay the indigenous people because they are part of the forest to actually keep those ecosystems um it's, there's got to be there's got to be better way and the other the other way is selling the compost obviously you could make compost as good as peter's like you know the price of the most expensive gold seal in the world and uh um that's another way um we're, 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 we've got to work on and figure out the best way of doing um my lecturer um my current one of my current lecturers one of my courses jennifer dungate she's amazing she knows everything about soil organic carbon soil organic matter like measuring stuff. I don't know whether it might be um I could ask her what her opinion is or if she seems to be that would be great maybe working with university that's what martin richards advised me was that yeah work with the university to to get testing done so i'm looking into that but um you know this biology testing is super important as well that, that we can do with christina or perry here in the network um but it's 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 what the compost then does to the soil that is going to be so important to know as well um i know yeah. which is why it's really important to encourage as many people to do baseline testing before they do anything. Mm. And, and that's something that we've kind of like learned in hindsight. You know, if we start a project on a new farm or with people, it's like get that tested at the very beginning before yeah. anything's done. So you can see how impoverished it is, but you can also see how it changes. Um, you know, and hindsight's a wonderful thing. So you can all of a sudden you like dump a load of comments. Oh, I should have done some baseline testing. Yeah. But you know, that's a really good um place to start. So I think the more of us that are able to show the increase, then the better. Definitely. Would you recommend um biology testing or you, is it other what kind of testing do you recommend as a baseline? As many as you can afford. <laughs> mm. Okay. Yeah, um, apparently some testing, uh, I don't, I haven't had enough quotes back yet, but um, somebody quoted five pounds to get some tested, which is like not too bad. Um, you know, you can do it yourself, you you weigh it before and you do an incineration in the oven, but no, uh, no agency is going to, it's like we do our kombucha tests in the brewery or with our own equipment and spreadsheets, but it's not until we've got them externally certified that can we actually use it to contact people like food you know the standard in the, the the trading industries to sort of give it the full green light we're going to need to get some external testing to prove it but obviously any way we can measure ourselves as we can do with the biology is going to be maybe, key maybe black mountain college are going to be doing that kind of thing with load teacher on a teacher load of students might want some samples from around the country maybe <laughs> yeah great i mean that wouldn't that be cool if we could work with the university and send like matt powers is going on about you know on his regenerative soil database there's going to be a a global soil carbon percentage i don't know how he's going to work that out but you know this is going to require go on mary so the, the, where, so i study at edinburgh but my degree is joint with the sruc which is scotland's royal college and their their main focus is like one of their main focuses is this so I think they, okay. they might be a place to, to ask. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and then we can literally be able to measure, if we do these tests, we'll be able to measure how quickly the microbes are restoring it and then how quickly different methods, like, you know, Sophie and Hannah was saying they want to get into biochar and compost teas, exactly the same here. I want to, I want to invest in that because that's the best way we have of, like, amplifying the habitat for these microorganisms and amplifying the carbon storage you know the, we're working with like this ridiculous surface area of biochar um to make things so much like more extensive in the soil ecosystem and also obviously the the full spectrum of microbes just it you know that the, the compost teas 
are a way of amplifying them with oxygen and molasses you know that's that's a whole nother thing it would be great to get some uh wisdom knowledge shared on that um as we go forward because compost teas are the best way a compost extract is good that's a way of getting the, the biology and the compost deep into the to the soil um where it can go to work as well building the sponge but a compost tea is like that times many percent because of the, the amplification from the oxygenated environment so yeah it's very exciting isn't it um Yes, can we? Can I wonder if we can get to rain, come back to some of the questions that were asked, challenges and questions and help, like um, Amy and Jess or Hannah and Sophie, um, without going too deep into. Do, have, are there any particular ones that are burning for you guys after what all the talks? Just. I was just going to wonder if the have been having any contact with the parish councils because often they have land and um, and they are wanting to do more community work. Uh, and so it feels like there's, there's a real kind of movement with the need for us to kind of engage more with parish councils. So I don't know if you've tried to communicate with them to find access to land. That's a good idea. And yeah. um, we've, we've, we've helped um, a community orchard where um, the parish council was very involved. Um, Maybe we should push the conversation there. Um, and the, the town council, it was more difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, mm. that's a good idea. Thank you. For us, um, we recently did um, an event with the co-op and um, maybe Daisy can talk a bit more about that. It's, um, some of the councillors from Talgarth, a neighbouring town and Hay, um, were really enthusiastic. What were they... Um, suggesting we kind of tap into Daisy. It was the um, so we're in quite a unique place. Hay on Wye is just on the edge of the Bracken Beacons National Park, um, and the Bracken Beacons National Parks have a sustainability fund, um, quite a deep pot of money that they're putting toward. They're aiming to put towards local organisations and local groups who are working um, towards sustainability and biodiversity and have the same goals and aims that we do. So this, I mean, the co-op were fantastic in connecting us. I would really recommend them as a, just as a network of organizations. Um, they put on this brilliant, it was actually, it was a volunteer um, push, um, but ended up turning into a really brilliant network evening um, where we had the opportunity to talk to the Brecon, but it was local councillors who were there on behalf of the Brecon Beatons National Park, um, who are really excited about what we're doing. And there's um, potentially a really massive funding opportunity there for them to, um and yeah fund our upscale and also potentially fund us as full-time employees which would be amazing <laughs> it'd be really incredible um and i know that that doesn't translate across um all areas of the uk because it's a national parks thing and because it's a protected area they're looking to also to, yeah protect the land that's around here specifically um but looking i never ever hurts to push out um, into those other, like, yeah, to tap into the local parish, uh, local councils and the parish councils, um, because they also have an awareness of pots of money that are out there that we had no idea existed. Um, this is the Bracken Beacons National Park was probably the standout connection that we made, but um, there was uh, there was also a lot of smaller organisations that were there that were really interested in what we were doing. Um, the they've completely actually Hannah might remember what they were called. It was. Like the, it was, they were called like the rugby, the rugby club or something. It was a really local, small scale. Oh, it was the Black Lion. Black Lions, Black Lions, Black Lions Club, um, who <laughs> who do have connections with the rugby world, but also have a pot of money um, to support mm. all organisations and causes. And we would have had no idea if we hadn't been there at that evening. So, yeah. Um, yeah clubs have money because they all pay a, a subscription into a pot and it just. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, clubs yeah, and community yeah. gardens. I just want to say, like, if you're doing a fun mm -hmm. bid for a community composting piece mm -hmm. of equipment, tie it in with a community garden, and then it just ticks mm -hmm. lots more boxes. And that's what all the people in Brighton have had yeah. great success with. Um, that was something that was brought up initially, actually, as well, because DDD is a fantastic site where we're based. This um, campsite, uh, like it's a, it's a stud farm, and but. 
it's a little bit out of hay and isn't connected to a community garden necessarily. So we're we're playing around with a few different sites, but um, they were really encouraging us. There's a heritage site in Hay, Hay Castle, um, who are, have got funding to do a lot more with their outdoor spaces, um, both like uh, to engage kids and schools, um, but also to protect the land that the castle is situated on. And there's potential there for us having another tumbler there. And it was that site that they felt would have made the difference. Um, it, because it's because it's a community location yeah it was yeah <laughs> um necessary i think <laughs> and, yeah, I think another thing is linking in so like the 10th to the 18th of june is the green week so you know linking on to things that are already happening and so you know that's always a good way um i mean like i've i've been booked for every day during green week um, but I think it's a really good way to kind of like hook in to things that are already going on as like, you know, can you go and give a presentation about this during this week? Because it ticks their boxes as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more of us that can kind of like really saturate the airwaves <laughs> during these like established, whether it's biodiversity day or it's green week or whatever it is, kind of ride on the backs of those as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually really good. Sorry, <laughs> um, so we, with the co-op fund fundraiser, we've um, there this year situation like platforming one of their um, courses every single month, and March is our month. Um, so that is something we're totally riding on and <laughs> hoping to saturate our social media channels with. But we've been, I think, trying to think of other ways to get our message out there for that month. They'll be platforming us in all the co-op. Um, social media channels and in all this in their local stores um but yeah thinking of also yeah uh more dynamic and creative ways mm. cool. has been a challenge isn't yeah <laughs> so getting um like sites for tumblers i think for us um most of the time it's just been people who know landowners that have got land that don't they don't really know what they're doing with it and they've just got a piece of land like they, they kind of want to do something good but aren't really using a piece of land and we're very rural so it, it might not be as applicable um for you guys but mm. that's really been over time it we, at the beginning we were really like god there's nowhere we were thinking of like little scraps of land or something that we'd have to get from the council but it turned out that wasn't really the case in the end we've just been given like word of mouth like suggestions of little fields or you know pieces of bit, bits of land people were offering us so it came up that way rather than um, through kind of applying with the council, which would have been much more long winded and hard work. And, and the other places is the churches. The churches have quite a lot of land. And um, in fact, we know uh, they, and they quite a lot of them are all in this eco church group. And, you know, they are actually doing quite a lot of really good stuff. And one of the examples I, I recently or spoke for this churches together and they were all talking about how they got compost systems, but they weren't big enough and that the people, their congregation were wanting to bring compost to them, but they didn't have a big enough setup. So it was like, oh, OK, so this shows as well. It's another kind of like edge group that have land. They got, a, you know, people. Um, so, yeah, I would recommend contacting the churches as well and seeing about their land. Ben. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say the same thing, Nicola, I mean, because we've been working with the church with the, uh, you know, the wilding the churchyard with uh, wildflowers, but they, they also have own our allotment site. So there's glebe land uh, all over the place. But there are other things like the National Trust have land, of course. And they have gardens and they some of the projects that i've worked with are on national trust properties um the <laughs> railways have land there's there's people like that also and and uh, i know that one of the projects in oakhampton near here um beth who's got another project called growing our future <laughs> funnily enough she she went to the town council there and they basically got every little scrap of land in Oakhampton that they can do things with. Some of them are just a tiny little plot with a kind of electricity box on it, you know, one of those green boxes. But um, there, there are bits and pieces around. And, and as Tom said, school schools, we've had community composting projects run in schools. So, you know, it's just a question of, of thinking laterally 
mm. uh, and, and going around to you know th those kind of places and and the businesses themselves you Just know, wanted to add on there nikki yeah you mentioned it allotments like i've chatted to a few allotment owners here in brighton and they think it would be totally feasible for a composting hub to be installed uh in in one of the entrancey communal areas leading into these allotment sites and 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 it would be a, a you know similar to what amy and jess are doing it would be a cultural change um mission to change to stop people from you know just uh kind of chucking it and forgetting about it in their own little pl plots and then just getting together and composting together where you can get better temperatures and make nicer compost um so that that's already happens. Oh, it happens it happens a lot i mean i've been i've given i think last year i gave three talks on allotment sites but and partly because people they've set up areas and then it's become a horrible mess because they haven't had a good system put in place yeah so they need to they need a bit of help and advice i mean for instance one of them they said how do we stop people putting our earthy earthy clods of stuff on the on the compost area and I said, well, you can't, but why don't you set up another bay and say, and put put your earthy clods here, rather yeah. than stopping people doing things, encourage them to do it in a different way. Yeah. And and they said, oh, that's genius. You know, so <laughs> it's very simple, but, you know, uh, you can you can tweak systems like that um, and then it works. And as long as it's clear and it's well marked and everything, people, it, it can work. I'm really keen to pipe up because I really want to speak and yes, say some welcome back. Hi. Firstly, in terms of like what a high quality gathering meeting this is tonight. So I want to express my gratitude. I am like really excited and delighted to be part of this group. Um, I don't know where to start with stuff I want to input, but I love the idea about micro composting, different scales of composting in the community to serve everyone's needs. So I'm in Devon. I work with Nikki with Devon Community Composting Network. Um, I'm also running a community composting group in Malden, which is the village I live in, in the South Hams in Devon on the edge of Torbay near Totnes. Um, and we're going to make it happen, I think. We're going to get a proper, like, larger scale community composting project. And we've been working on that since May. And I've, like, been driving it, but also with the local community, we've got a really cohesive group. But today, and this is why this meeting is so beautifully timed for me, um, being inspired by you all, the speakers, you are amazing. Like I have taken so many notes and I've got so many takeaways. Um, but I had a meeting with the local council. So I'm in an extraordinary position. I mean, not only am I lucky enough to know Nikki, who's like the godfather of composting and the, the ultimate mentor in the world um, <laughs> for connecting and all things good and generosity of spirit, et cetera. Um, I met at the council today, right? The South Hams Council in, in South Devon, they've pledged a massive amount of money for, com for community composting. They've written it in a letter, yeah, to every household, um, to every customer. And they've offered like a ridiculous amount of money, 200,000 pounds, right? To stimulate community composting. And it's taken months and months to get through to them. It's been like a touch and go thing. Like they've said, sent this letter out because they're stopping the free bin collect collections and they're charging. But they said, on the other hand, well, we want you to come forward. But it's been really hard. to it's been impenetrable, really, to get any communication from them. So I had a meeting today and looking at offering a proposal to do different scales of composting. So I've just got so many good ideas tonight. So I want to thank you all on how I can bring that, take that forward to the next level. Looking forward to the next meeting with Nikki, because I've got loads to talk about. And to be able to share my experience of different levels of scales of composting, and this is like a key for me tonight. Like I feel like I've unlocked sources of information, people and the togetherness. So just linking up with other people of like minds. Um, and it's such an exciting time and I've got a massive opportunity. I don't want to waste it. And I believe with the help of you all in community, like this can happen. So I'm really interested in, in biochar in a big way. How can this be brought into community composting? Um, I guess it has different merits and values in different climates or parts of the world, different soils. But that said, what a wonderful way to encourage people not to have bonfires for the sake of it, not to give them an excuse to say, oh, I'm going to have a bonfire because the council aren't collecting it for free. Um, and, you know, having a, a way to use the brush wood and for soil regeneration. So, Nicola, to hear your um, work overseas, um, it's just incredible about the alley cropping, 
and the pollarded wood and the and the cacao and using biochar to help with the fungal disease is just it's astonishing i think I, i've said enough i'm just bursting with enthusiasm and i want to say thank you all so mm -hmm. i've taken notes lots of them that was such a nice thank you ben thank you for that what a lovely introduction and yes yeah, just so nice to hear awesome um is there anyone else that uh, would like to um say anything or introduce themselves now after this, this. yeah peter thanks um uh to introduce me very briefly um, i so my compost involvement is well 60 years of making compost i suppose but then more recently community composting and fruit collecting uh, waste from uh, businesses and then making um, with a couple of rydans and sort of six five or six jurors I think um, anyway so gradually getting into things over the last year um, I had a couple of questions really um, one was for the hay the, the worms of hay um, and are, um, have you got contacts with um, and Sophie with Black Mountains no, not yet. But you did you teach with them? Already? Yeah, I do. That's why I'm thinking. So, so let's have. I'm very happy to have a little bilateral conversation. So, I, I do what's the seems well. I'm I'm doing another lot of um, workshops for them. Well, for councillors, for parish and town councillors on um, increasing their whole uh, climate literacy and and taking action on climate. But I know now through them a number of of, of people within them. Um, uh it, they work so yeah definitely i could contact them and they might well be interested in what you're talking about which would be great um and and and, and and tom they might well you know as a university and they're linked to they seem to have formal links to cardiff university and and may well have to others i mean they're not a university themselves but they've got they're well worth looking up black mountain college they're, i mean it's fantastic it's based all around climate change i mean essentially everything other than compost climate change and poverty are peripheral to everything i think anyway they're um I mean, everything else is, is kind of like interesting, but we haven't got time for it. <laughs> um, my other question um, was, again, was, was a hay one, probably, but it's more general, it was about selling compost. And I wondered, you were talking about selling, um, Hannah or Sophie, and I wondered if you, I, I know Tom will know I've been banging on or asking about this, about containers. Mm. We're, we're now selling our compost and we've got a certain... We've had some plastic um, buckets which we've been selling in, but but um, we haven't got that big. A, I mean, I know we can buy them, but I don't really want to do that. I want to use secondhand ones. But if anyone at, at any point finds a way to crack this problem of trying to sell a product which is essentially wet and living, so it's got to have air in it, mm. because as Tom's done that, you did those experiments, didn't you, where things died pretty quickly in a plastic bucket. Well, um, yeah, I'm about but, I mean, to get another to hold test it done. Very long. Sorry, sorry, John. I'm going to get another test done, Peter, because I, I did I did some uh, amendments to a plastic bucket as well, putting um, uh, like uh, about uh, three mil air holes on each side underneath the rim so it wouldn't affect the utility of the bucket uh, for other uses. And I've stored it like that for uh, for six months to see if that's affected it. So Whoa. see if that doesn't make okay. it. Better. I'm going to do it, send, send, get that test result back from Perry later in the week and then we could see if, if that's. Yeah, great. I only want to store it for a week or two weeks, really. It's just the oh, wow. delivering of compost and how, you know, how to get the stuff out there for people um, without yeah. killing it in the process. Because obviously okay. I don't want a mass genocide between Most compost important thing heap is the and microbes. the customer. Yeah. Yeah. We were thinking, um, we were going to do a promo on the Thursday market um, with samples and talking to people about um, that we're going to sell our compost and then get people to come to our site with their own containers. Okay. Yes, um, top, top tip, guys, do not just make sure they understand that the worms in the bucket, they are uh, aerobic and that they can't leave the lids of buckets on. I had customers come and pick compost up and they said they'd be there the next day and they were like three days and then open the lid and it stank and the worms were dead. It was awful. Um, so, yeah, just don't, don't, you can't, you know, you can't be, hey, I got dead worms. You've got to be... <laughs> <laughs> that was good, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, good, good tip. I mean, we just wanted to avoid the um, many plastic container situation, really. Um, and mm. also, because, like we thought, Hessian bags would would work. I know they rot, but it, do they rot that quickly? Depends how much you dry the compost out. Then obviously, drying is not really ideal for the biology. Well, it's it, it doesn't kill it necessarily. It just goes dormant and needs rehydrating. But it definitely reduces it somewhat, and it's just not 
necessary you know if it's got the perfect amount of moisture in the thriving community just give it to them like that so it's all about short life let short short supply chains and as little packaging as possible um i think we're going to go for for um sown hessian so we've got um somebody's said they've got a roll of hessian and um owen who you know tom's got he's just got a, a thing for sewing up sacks because he's grinding his own corn now nice so basically hand sewing our own hessian bags and see how long they'll last in that because if it'll last without rotting for 10 days or so that's fine by us because people should be scattering it anyway i mean great to be yeah got, to be got out we and you can just make it to order can't you you just prepare a date where yeah. you, bag, you bag it all up two days before two weeks before your event yeah. or whatever and that would work totally yeah hessian yeah. bags you could always double layer them They're, you can get big rolls of hessian very very cheaply and have a little sewing party make loads <laughs> it's a good way to link with other community groups isn't it to make hessian bags and sacks like a sewing yeah. gathering and such yeah the question that we yeah, had yeah. peter so thanks for raising that because in Molden we've been talking about that you know not wanting to leave it in plastic bags the compost and just i've seen community composting sites where they load up composting bags leave it in plastic bags for some time pile them on, on top of each other and mm. clearly that's not the best way to do it so yeah, yeah. hessian sounds all right yeah i think hessian's cool. good good Thanks i'm going to just like to quickly while we're on this subject guys just uh the next session is going to be a month's time so the 27th of march and i am going to do a presentation on um like I've, i decided i was going to call it complete compost creation for living soil regeneration like how to like lessons learned basically from you know if your purpose of creating compost is to restore as much living soil as possible which is then therefore to create as many microbes as possible and use the compost as a carrier to the land as in the best way possible. I'm going to just share my tests that Perry's done for me. I spent a few hundred quid uh, with Perry in the last um, couple of couple of weeks. Um, and I'm going to share all of the results, um, which are quite, re quite revealing. I've got a Johnson Sioux test uh, for six months. I've got a, a festering pile of apple pulp test for six months for the same time window. Um, and um, and a bunch of different complete composts, which are interestingly, because I know that we've made them in very similar ways in different places, but what mine have clearly shown is that the longer, so the more like established basic, yeah, I've had higher biodiversity because the whole compost site has been established longer and it's part of the wider garden ecosystem and birds and probably rats and other things have come and spread the biology from the wider garden and it's got it's got more diverse over you know it's much better as also the element of because there's just some interesting results to share um because yeah and so i, I want to do a talk on that and uh, i'm going to think if anyone wants to present about their experiences of, of of selling compost and share anything i'm i'd really welcome any contributions for that session on the at the end of march just so we can sort of yeah really get get Get, get, and, and it'll still be in time for us to put in some action to actually sell some compost because April and May are the, really the best times to sell when there's less frosts and stuff. Can I, um, I just remember something about um, Hannah and Sophie were talking about cardboard. Um, we had a very, there's a very interesting uh, project in, uh, in um, uh, near Salby Bridge with the Calderdale and Kirk Lee's project, they did the cardboard caviar project. Have people heard of that? Um, yeah. Where they were, so thinking of uh, Puran's uh, uh, mind map, big connecting mind map, Joe, um, Graham Wiles at the council there, he basically uh, did a map of all the, all the kind of businesses and um, everything in the area, in his area, that had anything to do with any kind of biodegradable compostable materials but it went wider than that actually it was like any any um, factory business that had a waste product something that they were putting on would could be a resource input for another project so he was building a circular economy in other words so he did this really uh, brilliant thing where cardboard was being shredded being used as as bedding for horses uh, and then another project was picking up the bedding for horses and and uh, with a worm farm. And some of those worms went to a, a like a petting zoo where they were freeze drying them and feeding them to koi carp. 
uh, with a with special needs project that was. But some of them were going to a sturgeon farm uh, to feed the sturgeon, and then they were producing caviar. So it was the cardboard to caviar project. So wow. those kind of like thinking of those kind of connections in that in that way is is really brilliant. And and to do it like uh, Nicholas says, you need that in, in a different context. But that baseline sort of planning of finding out what is going on and who's got what, where, and what you get those connections that you can make. You know, um, and there was a lot more to it that he did than that. But that was the the most perfect, neat example of a composting circle, circular economy. Just going on from that with connections, I've just put into the chat anybody that is wanting to um, have some contacts at universities that's working on soil health and um, biochar. So these are a few people that I've been into contact recently that I've shared with you. Um, and another interesting conversation I recently had with Charles Dowding about um, compost and the quality of compost. He's been doing some really interesting trials himself, which would be great for other people to replicate. And, um, you know, comparing the difference of his own homemade compost with lots of different bought com composts. And what they're finding is that a lot of bought compost has got derivatives of, um, you know, fer not fertilizers, um, herbicides. And, um, and so a lot of council waste, which has been sprayed from the verges, then is getting turned into green waste, turned into compost, getting packaged by various different compost makers. And he's getting zero germination rate in wow. some of the bought composts and as they like more people need to start doing comparison side by side tests on your own compost alongside varying different bought composts but it was really full on his his results that he's just been showing cool thank you nicola that's interesting we should get charles to to speak he's joined the forum so we should get him to share some stuff well Get in touch. Um, bye mary nice one okay <laughs> how I, I how's it going everyone um how are you doing for energy is we have this is normally like how long we make a session about an hour and 45 um yeah, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> is that is that do, it, it, would anyone <laughs> should we do like last last comments um last last ben you're you look like yeah a, i mean you need to say again right i, I really got to put together a compost club like bid like micro composting for that scale of work because we're trying to get these large community composting sites but for various reasons like finding the land it's proving tricky for the local communities at the moat um so looking at the forum that you put up on the screen earlier tom and yes. there's loads of resources to connect there's a compost club group is that right so i could go into the forum and tap people or pick people's brains on the compost club methodology and how that works with the jurors and having that sort of model I think it's really appealing for what I need to present in this bid. So um, that's a really, really exciting thing. So it's Ab all on the forum. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's on the it's on the forum in the spaces. So you might. Yeah, the forum has changed um, a little bit now. It's, it's, it's orientated more around these spaces. So just I just fully just like to tell everyone to just join all of the group spaces you might be interested in, because if you do have a question in the future, it might someone might have just posted the answer there. I'll also shout out to Mary. She's Mary's been awesome at taking um, just just making the, my, the mycology group really great. Um, she's, she's been sharing a lot of interesting stuff here. Um, I to, to be honest, I think the best way this forum is going to work is if, you know, as as mycelium members in different in different areas with different skill sets, we we take um, and, and and knowledge knowledge bases. We take we kind of take ownership of different groups and kind of like I'm adminning the WhatsApp group at the moment. Like, and it could we we kind of take a bit of responsibility to admin different groups and just make sure that you know all the knowledge shared is being is being really as good as it could be um as good as it, it needs to be um but you know they're conversation spaces every post is a conversation space um and you can search the posts up here you can search anything so the home page i changed it recently so the home page is where there's like really general stuff so appropriate technology community gardens funding and jobs and then what's going on there's loads of bringing happening um 
and then these the rest is soil school this is like stuff to learn about the soil and then compost creation which is where compost clubs um complete composting selling compost these are all spaces i think kind of should exist because they are subjects unto themselves um so just join the space there's nothing there's no harm in in joining the space um you we you don't have to set a notification if you do a post but you've just put it there for someone to benefit from in the future if they really need an answer um so i hope that's helpful yeah they do i just they just uh, my advice would be join all the spaces you're interested in um use the the feed to sort of check out what's general like generally going on in the group that you'll always see the the, the events up there or latest posts like i just shared this really good one about effective microbes uh, and then you can also use this discovery feature, which is what the most people are talking about um, on the network and the latest events, et cetera, uh, members near you and stuff like that. It's 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 got real potential to be a really useful tool. Um, just, yeah, it is like it needs it needs a movement to be uh, to, to sort of own it because one per yeah, one, one location isn't really going to sort of make it yeah, realize its potential um yeah and and on that note i'm just gonna stop this recording now guys